Well, as you grab uh, your Bible, or if you don't have one, the Pew Bible next to you, make your way to 1 Samuel 27. Uh, always want to be sure, if at all possible, that you you have uh, your Bible or a Bible open, right? You want to make sure to look in God's Word yourself and be more familiar with it each time, and make sure that the things that we say are actually in there. <laughs> always good practice. First Samuel 27, starting in verse 1. Then David said in his heart, Now I shall perish one day by the hand of Saul. There is nothing better for me than that I should escape to the land of the Philistines then Saul will despair of seeking me any longer within the borders of Israel, and I shall escape out of his hand. So David arose and went over, he and the six hundred men who were with him, to Achish, the son of Naal, the king of Gath. And David lived with Achish at Gath, he and his men, every man with his household, and David with his two wives, Ahinoam of Jezreel and Abigail of Carmel, Nabal's widow. And when it was told Saul that David had fled to Gath, he no longer sought him. Then David said to Achish, If I have found favor in your eyes, let a place be given me in one of the country towns that I may dwell there. For why should your servant dwell in the royal city with you? So that, so that day Achish gave him Ziklag. Therefore Ziklag has, been, has belonged to the kings of Judah to this day. And the number of the days that David lived in the country of the Philistines was a year and four months. Now David and his men went up and made raids against the Gersherites and the Gizerites and the Amalekites, for these were the inhabitants of the land from of old, as far as sure to the land of Egypt. And David would strike the land and would leave neither man nor woman alive, but would take away the sheep, the oxen, the donkeys, the camels, and the garments, and come back to Achish. When Achish asked, Where have you made a raid today? David would say, against the Negeb of Judah, or against the Negeb of uh, Jer Jeramelites, or against the Negeb of the Kenites. And David would leave neither man nor woman alive to bring news to Gath, thinking, lest they should tell about us and say, so David has done. Such was his custom all the while he lived in the country of the Philistines, and Achish trusted David, thinking he has made himself an utter stench to his people, Israel. Therefore, he shall always be my servant. You can actually read the first couple verses here into 28 as well. In those days, the Philistines gathered their forces for war to fight against Israel. And Achish said to David, Understand that you and your men are to go out with me in the army. David said to Achish, Very well, you shall see what your servant can do. And Achish said to David, Very well, I will make you my bodyguard for life. I don't know if you've ever had the experience of getting the opportunity to meet a personal hero or someone famous or influential, someone you've admired from afar for a long time, only to find out that he or she is not the person you thought that he or she was. This is a very candid look. And I don't know if you caught this, but nowhere in that entire chapter is God ever mentioned. Nowhere in this candid look at David do we hear any mention of God, any seeking of God. In passages like this, it's even more important then. After we've been watching David from afar, and, and we have so many admirable times, especially the last chapter when David is really on a pedestal. Now we come up close again. So important that before we come to David in this chapter, that we go to God first. This is why we pray. We talked about this in Sunday school. One of the functions of the Holy Spirit now that the canon is closed, the revelation, the new inspired word of God is, is done, it's closed, it was given to us through the apostles. But the Holy Spirit's job now is to take God's word and illuminate that to us, to open 
our eyes, to open our minds like Christ did as those um, disciples of his, you remember at the end of Luke, were, were walking along and talking about what had happened and Luke records that it was Jesus who had to open their minds so that they could understand what was happening. We need the Lord to help us understand what is happening here. Father, we ask for your help now by the Holy Spirit's power as he works in and through and around us that we would understand what you are revealing to us in this passage of Scripture, what you are revealing of yourself to us, what you are revealing of us and and of mankind, of our sin, of our need and dependence of you and of Christ, what you are revealing about our Savior Jesus and about redemption. Father, draw us to Christ more closely as we study your word. Guide the words that are spoken. Guide the words that are heard. And may all that remain in us be of you and from you and for you. Make us more like Christ, we pray, through our time now in your word. We pray it for Christ's sake. Amen. It's always a shame, right? When you when you when you you see somebody, and you know magazines are kind of a thing of a past, but digital content makes it even more more likely that that we we find someone that we admire them, and especially maybe when we're younger. I mean, it used to be the thing, right? The guys and girls they'd have that heartthrob on a poster up on their wall. I don't even know that people do that anymore. They probably just put it up on social media or something. I don't even that they make posters anymore. What a shock when you when you meet this person and you find out there's a lot of airbrushing going on. <laughs> there's a lot of work going on behind the scenes, and that person doesn't even look anything. In fact, we uh, this this a couple of weeks ago we were discussing in the office there was a um, a real estate agent that that some of the people in the office are familiar with, and and they had advertised that they had a, a new person working with that company, um, and put up this this nice headshot of this woman. She's very attractive woman, and uh, for whatever reason, one of the ladies in the office wanted to know when to familiarize herself with, with the new people that we might be working with and went to this this woman's personal uh, social media uh, page, and they had done a lot of work. This is not even, didn't even look anywhere near the same. But it was so important to this company that they put that kind of an image out. Well, what a shock that will be, right, when someone actually has to work with this individual and finds out, you don't even look like the same person. It, I remember when we uh, we were big fans, we, we had gotten into Jesse and I going into seeing some of these people in person. We wouldn't necessarily get each other things for Christmas, but we would go out on, on dates. We would spend a little money. We went to see a show at Starlight to see Steve Martin and Martin Short. And, and uh, we liked comedy, and so we had liked some of the shows like Last Man Standing and Home Improvement. And Tim Allen was coming to Kansas City. So we got tickets and we went to see him. And it was about all I could do to stomach and I probably should have except for the money that I paid. We got good tickets too, we were close and I wanted to walk out in about five minutes. He was so not what I was expecting. You know, you hear oh, his life has changed around and, and you watch his shows and you watch his movies and they're fairly clean and that was nothing like what that man was on the stage. Such a disappointment because I had one view in mind of who this man was and what we were going to experience. And you have sort of a, especially if you pay that much money, sort of a, you're invested in this person and you appreciate some of the things that you sometimes see in their other work. And then to get there and find out, right? This, this guy who's played Santa Claus and you love all these movies when you're a kid. Talk about how much he hates kids. It was so despair. I mean, it was just such a discouraging experience. Well, once again, the Lord has been careful not to leave us with any airbrushed, CGI, whitewashed version of David. Because coming out of 26, well, we had a pretty high, man. Listen, he's figured it out, right? He learned his lesson. He had a good run at it. Kind of lost his cool with this naval guy. God got him back on track. Now, he, I mean, he's right there at Saul's head with the spear and and and. Just look at what a good job David did. 
And I, and I hesitate, sometimes we use the term Bible hero to refer to this person because in a story from a literature perspective, right, he's the protagonist, he's the hero, he's the good guy. But ultimately, a passage like this proves to us that, that really Christ is the only one who's worthy of being referred to as the hero, as the central figure. And, and even more striking, as I mentioned, there's no mention of God anywhere in this chapter. But we have this really... <laughs> candid look at David, and it's not good. It's not good at all. We've been following the ups and downs of his story, and we're just coming off this giant up, and now right on the heels of that, he falls straight into fear and despair. You can see that in the first four verses. Right? What, what does he start doing? How many times have we done this? David's talking to himself. And what's he telling himself? I'm done for. This is it. It's over. He's going to get me now. The only thing I can do is run and hide. I've got all these men and their families counting on me. I can't do this. I've got to run to the enemy. This collapse is monumental. And he's doing it to himself. He's talking to, but he knows better, right? How many of the Psalms have we read? I think it's Psalm 62 where the Lord I know is my only refuge. You just walked into the middle of Saul's camp you know this, David, how many times, right? Whether it's the lions and the bears or Goliath or Saul or, or any of these people, you know this. And the first thing, he's going to get me one day. I will die by the hand of Saul. What? You think of like 1 Kings 18. Remember um, Elijah at Carmel and the, and the prophets of Baal? 400, I think it's 450 of them. And they've got this big showdown and they build two altars, right? And Elijah says, I tell you what, you build an altar and I'll build an altar. And whichever one burns to the ground, that's the real God. And so they build this whole thing and they try and light this on fire and they're chanting for days and they're cutting themselves and Elijah taunts them. Maybe your God's gone to the bathroom. Maybe he's fallen asleep. It really is kind of comical, but he, he taunts them. He goes, okay, I'll show you what. This is how it works now. And he pours water all over his altar and he prays to God. The lightning comes down and incinerates the whole thing. And he slaughters them all. And that is an epic victory. And that is like total triumph. And what does he do? He finds out that Ahab and Jezebel want to kill him. And he runs off. And he hides. And he goes under a broom tree and waits to die. Me and me only. I'm the only one left. And he's waiting to die. Like that. Like, did you not just see what God did? And, and now you're in complete despair. Or Peter. Right? Lord, I will never leave you. I'm going right to the end. I'm going to, we've got this. And, and what does the Lord tell him? This night, before the rooster crows three times, you'll deny you even know me. And that girl shows up. She says, aren't you one of his? He goes, I don't even know the man. In a matter of hours, it can happen that fast. Well, this is where David has ended now. The record, the, 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 the warts and all picture of these Bible heroes, right? First of all, what a testament to the authenticity of the, of the account. Because if anyone was trying to just simply write a story to make it all sound very nice and very good and look at these awesome men, they would certainly not record a story like this. Secondly, how much does a passage like this remind us that we are not here to look at David for David's sake. This is not the answer. He is not the solution. And we go from one king to the next king to the next king to the no king and to what's going on until Christ shows up on the scene. And he's the one. He's the only one. He's the only solution. He's the only righteous one. He's the only completely faithful one. He's the only one to endure this and worse and remain faithful. Christ is the only hero, even in the Old Testament. And a picture like this shows that to us. Secondly, what an encouragement to a bunch of old clay pots. How David, how David was used by God and how precious David was to God. <laughs> and we get to see how much of a cracked, old, faulty clay pot even David was. 
So when Paul says, we have this treasure in jars of clay so that the surpassing greatness of God, of Christ, would be known. We're in good company with other old cracked clay jars like David. Because sometimes it's easy to get discouraged. You think, boy, I could never do that. I could never have a victory like David. I don't know that I could have done all this and God can't use me. Well, <laughs> David wasn't perfect either. God chose to use David and he didn't call any of us to be the king of Israel, that's for sure. David's got a unique place. But he also didn't put you here just to put you here. God has a plan and a purpose for all things for his glory. Furthermore, for the good of his own people, for those who love him, the scripture says, and are called according to his purpose. You have a purpose in Christ. And it's not your fame, not your glory. But you do have a purpose. And God is able to use whomever, whenever, however he chooses. David is tired. He is stressed. He is overwhelmed. And that is a perfect recipe to fall right into fear and to faithlessness. And how many times on the heels of our greatest victories do we experience our greatest tragedies, our greatest moments of disaster. David forgets to lean on God's understanding, right? Isn't that what the proverb says? Lean not on your own understanding. It doesn't say don't use your understanding. It says don't lean on it. David forgot everything that he knew about how God was his only refuge and God had always been a faithful refuge that he would never falter or fail We've ex probably experienced this a number of times in our own lives. What a blessing then. When we get in our own heads, Lord knows I have been there too many times. And you feel bad because I know these things. I know that God is with me. I know that God loves me. I know these things, but I don't feel like it. I feel like all is lost, all is done. I don't know where we go from here. What a blessing to have a friend. In Jesus, what a blessing to have a friend, a family member, a companion, a brother or sister in Christ who will take the time to remind you of the things they know you already know or they hope you already know. To share scripture with you, even though you may have read it, to read it to you, to say it to you out loud again. What a blessing you can be to remind others, even though you think they may already know you're not trying to be pretentious. You're not trying to do anything other than to say, I know how you can get down. Brother or sister, don't forget, this is what the scripture says. How important it is to see cases like this so that we can remember when we get down and when we really screw up. Moses, murderer, God used him. God walked with him. Peter, David, these were flawed people. Abraham, Sarah, they, they had some royal screw-ups. God was always faithful. We need to learn to speak, not doubt and fear and these things to ourselves and lean on our own understanding and feelings, but to use the word of God to encourage and to build up. So this is what's going on. And David decides he's going to leave. He's going to go to the land of the Philistines, which he does. Achish apparently thinks, well, maybe he's got over his madness. Remember, he put on quite a show last time he was there. And he comes back, and then in five through seven, you can see how clever he is, right? You know what? I really shouldn't be here using your resources in the royal city. How about you just give me a town out in the country somewhere where me and my guys, we can all go. Because, I mean, it's 600 men, but they got their families. So you could at least double that, probably more. So he gives him Ziklag, and this is perfect because he's outside of the bounds of Israel, right? so he's kind of out of Saul's reach. But at the same time, he's outside of Achish's reconnaissance. Achish can't see what he's doing. And what does David do then? And this part, this is certainly questionable, but, but is his cunning. Remember what the, the, the people in Ziph told Saul, better be careful. This David's cunning. He's clever. He's a sharp guy. And you better, better watch out what you're doing. David employs this then to put himself in the perfect spot, out of Saul's crosshairs, out of Achish's reconnaissance, and then he proceeds 
to take it to the enemies of Israel. These ites, right? These ites had been in the land, says from of old, right? Th these were some of the original people that God had sort of championed or asked Israel to get rid of and they moved into the land. But then how does he pass this off to Achish? Well, first of all, he lies to him. Second of all, he kills every last one. Nobody can come back. And there's a big debate. Maybe you weren't aware of this. Whether or not this was a good thing. Can we justify what David's doing? He's lying and he's killing whole groups of ites out there. Now, granted, that was God's original charge and the people, the leaders of Israel, did they failed to do that. But you don't hear God telling him, hey, remember that thing I asked you guys to do a really long time ago? I need you to finish that. And he's lying to Achish. There's a debate about whether or not what David's doing is right in any way, shape, or form. This is not David's finest moment, for sure. For a year and four months, a year and four months, he's doing this sort of thing. Well, he does this then, and you can see that in 8 to 12, how he's doing all these things. He's lying, he's killing all these ites, he's leaving none alive. And at this point, um, is really where you notice, right? There, there's no mention of God here. Normally you have God saying, go go here, go go this way, do this and do that, but, but there's nothing. And the commentators don't seem to agree on whether or not this was good or bad. He's finishing an original job, but maybe he's got the wrong motive. It doesn't seem that he's doing this in order to do what God had asked him to do, although he's attacking the enemies of Israel. He's putting Israel in a better spot. You can see there, it says in verse 11 that he's doing it so that no one talks, so that he can't be found out. That's why he's doing it. Well, <laughs> turns out that he did maybe too good of a job. And that's why we got into verse or chapter 28. Achish sees that he's doing such a good job when Achish then decides that he's going to go to war against Israel. He's like, well, this David, right? They got to hate him now. Look at this guy. He's been killing them because that's who David tells him that he's been going after. He's been going after these Israelite groups, the Negev of Judah. The ne Those are all Israelite people. Achish is like, well, they're going to hate him. He's virtually my servant for life now. So we're, we're going to go to, together to fight Israel. And, and notice how David answers him. You'll see what I can do. <laughs> How clever is that? Right? To say just enough and not enough all at the same time. You'll see what I can do. And then out of nowhere, verse 3, now Samuel had died. Huh, what? Right? Do, do we get to hear about the battle? Do we get to see what that? Well, we do. It's like a chapter over. I remember I was watching the NBA Finals in 1994. Houston Rockets, I love the Houston Rockets. I was a big Hakeem Olajuwon fan, loved that guy. And they were playing the team I hated the worst, worst of any team ever. I hated the New York Knicks. Man, I just could not stand John Stark and Patrick Ewing. Just couldn't stand to look at these guys. Watching this game, and out of nowhere, you know, bringing this to you live, right? And there's some guy racing around L.A. in a white Bronco. I'm like, <laughs> but the Rockets are still playing the Knicks and I need to, this is like game six games are like, what's going on? Like, he'll stop sometime. Who's OJ? I don't know, but like, the game is going on, right? No, 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 I had to, I had to wait for this whole thing out of nowhere, right? And it's almost so as the writer is saying, right? So here's the situation. You think David's in bad shape? Just wait till you see what Saul's about to do. Saul is going completely off the charts. And if you read that heading, Saul and the medium of Endor, no, this is, I don't think this is where George Lucas got this name for Star Wars. Well, this, is where the Elo, this is where the Ewoks lived, in case you're curious about this. Yes, that was Endor too, but this is a different Endor. He goes to see a witch, a medium, something God had expressly, vehemently forbidden. It's a, it's a real biblical ghost, ghost story about to happen. Saul's lost his mind. And so the writer just breaks in. We're, we're getting ready for this battle, and what is David going to do, and how's he going to get himself out of that? And by the way, look what Saul's doing. 
Again, they, they, David, David is not the solution. And, and you think of him as a mess, but Saul is even worse off. I want to read to you a quote that, that Ralph Davis um, gave to us. And I think this, this just captures it so well. Um, it's a little bit lengthy, but I, I think it's good. All right, it's not Ralph Davis. It's Dale Ralph Davis. Sorry, I want to give credit where credit's due. He writes, you, you must get a grip on grace. The Bible does not claim that God's servants are dipped in Clorox so that they will be infallibly sin-free and attractive to you. The living God does not have clean material to work with. And don't get sentimental when you sing hymns about the potter and the clay. Remember, it's only sinful clay the potter works with. We should not criticize the potter because of the clay, but rather marvel that he stoops to work with such stuff. As long as we wallow, however subtly, in some idea of human worthiness, we will never understand the Bible, never tremble before this God, and never delight in this God. We must get a grip on grace. Maybe a godless text can do that for us. Powerful moments of weakness and opportunities to fail often present themselves on the heels of some of our experiences of greatest triumph. That's why Paul says, take heed lest you fall. Beware of putting too much stock in your own personal righteousness when it comes to evaluating your salvation as well. Right? Should we strive for righteousness and obey faithfully? Absolutely. Should we rely less on Christ's saving power and righteousness? Should we feel less dependent when we triumph, when we, when we pull off a good, when we, we face temptation and we recognize that we, we didn't give in? Should we be less dependent on Christ? Absolutely not. But that's the temptation. On the other hand, should we despair of Christ's saving power or his love when we fail, when we sin? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. Put the word in and around you. God has provided a perspective and a principle, and it is sometimes difficult to lean on his understanding instead of ours, right? Is staying in Israel, is that belief that God will um, uh, protect me, or am I tempting God? Am I being presumptuous? When I leave, am I, am I being prudent or am I being faithless? We have these points of decision, and we don't know what to do, and we can see, well, I I could go this way. I could go that way. I don't know what to do. And, and we say, well, the Bible doesn't help me out. No, the Bible's not going to say right on the, you know, 20th of January in the year 2005, you need to go left instead of right. It's not, it doesn't work like that. But he has given us perspective and principles and stories like this, accounts like this, are some of those things, the wisdom of the Proverbs, the reality of, of David's subjective experience of life in the Psalms and his objective speaking of the truth about who God is. We have to compile all these things and keep these things in us, encourage one another with these things and give ourselves to the reading and attending the preaching of God's word and the study of God's word. So that in these moments, we have understanding that transcends our own understanding on which to lean while we try to use our understanding to make decisions day to day in life as they come right it's not a contradiction between leaning on the truth of god's word for perspective and principles and as paul would say to renew our minds so that we may be able to prove and test what god's will is right to renew our minds with God's understanding that we're leaning on the foundation of God's word, then we exercise our understanding and our decision-making and our actions and our attitudes and in our words and our affirmations with one another and ourselves. Don't spend time telling yourself lies. Watch out for fear and faithlessness because sometimes they will be right on the heels of when you think that you don't have anything to worry about because you've finally arrived. Brother, sister, you haven't arrived, neither have I. Let's encourage one another and help one another so that when we look at a story like this, we're both cautioned 
and encouraged that God is always at work in the lives of his people. Amen.